Good evening, everyone. Um, before we begin the class tonight, let me just review uh, the last classes. There will be three after this, and then we'll be through with the course as such. As I've said many times, after that, we will have informal discussions largely based on books I have written, and that could last us a while because I've, I've written 27 so far. And I'm working on some more. Speaking of which, a new book of mine, number 26, uh, has just come out. Uh, it is on the, it's called The Body of God, A Reader's Guide to the Sura of the Temple. And it is a deep study of the Sura of the Temple. And of course, we've gone over that work in our class. So you may be interested to see how much more there is than what we uh, studied in class. This is available right now through the Association for Baha'i Studies, or it will soon be available if it's not already online via the Baha'i Distribution Service and Amazon and other booksellers as well. So tonight we're going to talk about the... Um, we, we last week dealt with the uh, uh, institution of the custodians, which is now become the uh, one of the twin branches of the faith, and that is the institution of the learned in Baha. Now, we just usually call him the institution of the learned, but I always say in Baha because that's the complete quote because it doesn't mean they necessarily have a PhDs and, and uh, the kind of learning they have is, is a depth of understanding of the faith, the covenant, and the main quality they demonstrate is complete service and fidelity to the cause. So last week we studied how they helped usher in the transition from the passing of the guardian to the election of the House of Justice, what an important role they played. Tonight, we're going to go and uh, over their second function. Remember, the they were assigned three functions in the will and testament of Abu Baha: the uh, uh, approval of the guardian's selection for his successor, uh, and of course, that didn't occur because the guardian didn't appoint anyone. Uh, but it occurred in the sense that they had the responsibility for seeing that uh, Mason Remy's claim did not uh, uh, succeed. Uh, so tonight we'll go over their second function, uh, or a second function of theirs, which is the um, um, function of protection. And... Um, the uh hold on i'm trying to admit some people here uh and the um third function we will uh, go over after that that will be class this is 80 and that will be 81 82 will be the function of the learned and and in can they're functioning with the house of justice the twin institutions are working together insofar as creating and carrying out the teaching plans are concerned. And we're going to focus on particular on the more recent teaching plans, uh, both those that have just immediately uh, preceded us, the four five-year plans, and the one we have now begun, the uh, nine-year plan. And then we will, uh, uh, the class after that will be the uh, what will occur between now and the lesser peace, what will bring about the lesser peace and what uh, function the Baha'i faith will have in relation to that, uh, the advent of that change or transformation in the human body politic on planet Earth. And then we'll conclude with a view or an attempt to get some idea of what the golden age of Baha'u'llah will be like. My, kind of imagine, if we will, uh, uh, what it would be like to live in such a, uh, a community, a, a global community. Uh, and of course, it doesn't take more than a handful of the 
laws and teachings that will uh, will be uh, in full force at that time to say, I want to be there. I want, I want to live then. Uh, but as uh, Paul Lample has said often, we may wish we lived in that time, but we, uh, as it is, live in the formative age, and our job is to bring about the lesser peace and bring about the golden age uh, of Baha'u'llah, the world order of Baha'u'llah after that. All right, um, so let me uh, share my screen and we'll go over some things that uh, deal with the function of protection. We've discussed it a little bit. We're going to go in more detail tonight. Um, and if you will let me share my screen and go to the beginning and begin the slideshow from the beginning. Okay. Completing the institution of the learned in Baha, teaching and protection. Well, we're going to go over protection tonight. Remember the mandate of the hands of the cause, who, which begins the institution of the learned. This is the first stage of it in 1921 in the Will and Testament of Abdu'l Baha, uh, you have the obligation they had to appoint nine members or choose, excuse me, elect by secret ballot, nine members which would function as a body to give approval or to disapprove of the guardian's choice of successor. Since the guardian deceased without appointing a successor, that uh, obligation was gone, but as custodians of the faith, they had the obligation to oversee the faith between the passing of the guardian in 57 and the election of the House of Justice in 63. And as we're going to go over again tonight, they had to deal with another obligation they had, which is protection of the cause. And that was and still remains a function of theirs in so far as uh, dealing with any problems that arise. But most particularly, we're going to focus on covenant breaking. What is covenant breaking? How do we distinguish it from those who simply attack the faith? Or how do we distinguish a covenant breaker from someone who's lost their administrative rights? And what does that mean? And then next week, as I said, we'll deal with the teaching plans, focusing where we are now, though we will also review some of the previous plans and what they brought about. In particular, next week, we're going to focus on a very important transition that took place at the beginning of the sequence of five-year plans, though it's clear in the four-year plan that preceded those plans that the House of Justice was preparing us for a massive change in the way plans were uh, distributed among the nations and how they were carried out. So what is the value of studying history in general? I'm talking here about Baha'i history, of course, though, as we said in the very first class a couple of years ago, uh, you can't separate human history from history of religion because, as we believe in the Baha'i faith, human history derives from the appearance of the manifestations, and without that, there would be no progress. As Abu Baha is fond of saying, it would, it would, the world would be like an animal, a, a pasture of animal appetites. Uh, and the covenant, and the covenant, of course, we've been studying all along uh, with the transitions from the Bab to Baha'u'llah. Of course, we studied it before that in uh, Moses' uh, selection of uh, um, uh, oh, fought, the, fought the Battle of Jericho. Oh, I can't remember offhand. We'll, you'll tell me when we get through uh, his successor and Christ appointed Peter uh, ostensibly and Muhammad appointed Ali and the Bab did not explicitly appoint anyone, though he indicated clearly in a number of ways that this successor was Baha'u'llah. And then Baha'u'llah, of course, appointed uh, Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha appointed Shoghi Effendi uh, and Shoghi Effendi 
uh, constructed the finishing touches on the covenant as he prepared for the election of the House of Justice, with the interregnum being carried out and looked over by the uh, institution of the hands, the custodians of the cause. So uh, at each link in this chain, and a chain is a good analogy because you break one link on a chain and the chain is severed, period. Whatever it is upholding or holding uh, is is uh, let go and all is undone. So each late link in the covenant is critical. That is the covenant of Baha'u'llah. Uh, the other covenants, the prior covenants did not succeed. Uh, but when we study history, and especially in relation to the covenant, we understand where we came from. And I'm talking about this both as human beings and as Baha'is. Where did the Baha'i faith come from? How did it originate? What forces and movements shaped our present condition, where we are now in the Baha'i faith? Where would we like to be in, in Baha'i history? And where are we? Uh, where are we headed? And how can we shape that future? Uh, this is, of course, extremely important, and especially in relation to the plans that we're going to discuss next week, <clears throat> and particularly the plans we are in or have just been in. What lessons can we learn from studying these questions? Uh, and what specific action should I, uh, should I take, it should be, should I do at this critical time? Uh, what, what is my responsibility in this plan? And will I be held accountable for my responses? Uh, well, we know that one of our obligations, of course, is to teach, and others also to protect the cause. Um, and uh, we know from these plans what specific methods we are supposed to utilize in our community and building communities and supporting uh, the progress of the faith and its concepts uh, in every way we can. So what is breaking the covenant? Um, and how is it distinct as uh, from someone who's been deprived of administrative rights? And what should be our attitude towards covenant breakers? And what should be our attitude towards people who have lost administrative rights? Why should I study the covenant? Why should I study the actions of the covenant breakers? And finally, if the covenant is secure, and that is once we've elected the House of Justice, the covenant is complete, why is studying it of value? It's past history, right? Uh, apparently not. Uh, apparently it is extremely important, and I'll show you the evidence of that. Well, a covenant breaker, of course, uh, I say of course, uh, let me not assume that, that you know that or that I understand it the precisely, but as I understand it, covenant breaking is the attempt on someone who is a Baha declared Baha'i, who is a follower of the Baha'i faith, who attempts to uh, vitiate or violate or tear apart the administrative structure. But they are not immediately designated as such because they take one or two actions that are inappropriate in that regard. Um, and uh, if they uh, resign from the faith, uh, then they don't come under the uh, administrative auspices of the by administrative order. And so they can't be declared a covenant breaker. So it's someone who persistently and consistently attempts to uh, undo the Baha'i administrative order and, and usually by involving others. But this is only done, this action of officially declaring someone a covenant breaker, after they have been um, counseled and uh, been in touch with either uh, the uh, members of the administration, whether it be the counselors, the National Assemblies, the House of Justice, and so on, they will be counseled uh, at length and given many chances to uh, 
change their mind before such an action is taken. So it has to be some, basically, as I will say later in this presentation, you, you pretty much have to kick yourself out of the Baha'i faith. No one's going to uh, um, be legalistic in, in this. So what should be our attitude towards covenant breakers? Well, uh, we should pray for them and feel sorry for what th th they've done. But pers our personal relationship should be severed. We are not supposed to have contact with them because their purpose is to undermine the faith and it has a deleterious effect on the people who are studying the faith or people who are already Baha'is. Why should I study the covenant? Well, that's what this class is about and I hope you understand when we get through. Uh, but basically so that you can respond to people who have questions about, well, I'm, I agree with this, but I'm not sure I agree with that part. Or I think that Abdul Baha was who he claimed to be, but I'm not sure the guardian has all the authority that he claimed, that he was infallible, for example. Uh, why should I study the actions of the covenant breakers? Well, because this isn't... Uh, uh, a past history. This is on an ongoing struggle. In other words, uh, the covenant itself is complete. <clears throat> this doesn't mean there won't be efforts to undo it or sever it, as we have uh, seen in the past. So uh, what is the value of studying it? Well, uh, the value is to protect yourself and to protect others and to protect the covenant itself. So let's see some more about this. It is such an important subject that book eight, the uh, the the studying of the covenant in, in book eight, the covenant of Baha'u'llah has three units. Each unit is over a hundred pages long. Uh, there, it's an incredible study. It goes into much more detail and so far as the points of transition in the Baha'i faith are concerned, than our class has by far. Uh, so unit one is the center of the covenant and his will and testament, which is 97 pages long. This is, of course, talking about Abdul Baha and the important institutions he created in the will and testament, which we've talked about at length, but the Universal House of Justice, how it's elected, the establishment of the National Spiritual Assemblies, the establishment of the guardianship, the powers of the guardian and the succession of the guardian and so on. The institution of the hands of the cause, how they are appointed and what their functions are. Unit two, also uh, about 100 pages long, is about the... Uh, the guardian and uh, what his authority was, how he was appointed, uh, what he, what test he encountered from covenant breakers uh, and enemies of the faith. Now, what's the difference between a covenant breaker and an enemy of the faith? <clears throat> well, clearly, a covenant breaker is an enemy of the faith in the sense that they are trying to destroy the administrative order. Uh, if not the totality of it, at least some part of it. But an enemy of the faith is someone who's not a Baha'i, never has been a Baha'i, is, but is simply trying to destroy the faith. They may be uh, of another religion, or they may just be very uh, cynical and not like religion or like anyone who claims to uh, believe in God or in spiritual uh, underpinning of history. Unit three uh, is 106 pages long, and that's on the Universal House of Justice, its authority, how it is established, uh, what its powers uh, are, and so forth. And we've gone over that before. Um, we um, can um, go into parts of it again. Let's begin with the, this point. And here again, we're focusing, remember, <clears throat> on covenant breaking, how it comes about, what the response is. And particularly, we're going to use the example that we established last week, though we've seen it in the uh, actions of Mirza Yahya. We saw it in the actions of Mirza Muhammad uh, Ali. 
uh, and we saw it in the actions of Mirzab, uh, uh, Mirza Mab Sorab, uh, and so far as the Guardian was concerned, and Mason Remy and those who followed him. Uh, no one is inherently sinful or evil. And so <clears throat> I say that, and it become apparent why I'm saying it by the end of the, the, the class tonight, uh, that uh, when these individuals who've later become covenant breakers become Baha'is, they may have the best of intentions. I mean, certainly we are just dumbfounded when the amuensis of Baha'u'llah uh, becomes a covenant breaker. He has been, he was the first to believe in Baha'u'llah and uh, transcribe so many of his texts. How could he possibly uh, become a covenant breaker? But he did. So we can't presume that the, if we look at the life of Mason Remy, and we're going to for just a second, uh, we shouldn't try to find, well, where, where are the signs of his iniquity? Uh, where did he go wrong, and so forth? It may have been a sudden, a sudden impulse uh, that occurred to him. Hey, I could have this if I wanted to, you know, or at least there's an argument for it. And there were those who uh, planted the seed of this idea in his mind, just as you had um, Sayyid Muhammad of Isfahan, who urged Mirza Yahya to do some of the evil things that he did. But you, you can't presume that one is born evil or sinful or so forth. No one is. Everyone is potentially, as, as this uh, statement says about uh, by Abu Baha about children, they are potentially the light of the world or its darkness. Potentially, we have the ability to be uh, the best of people uh, are, are the worst. So free will is a very important theme in the Baha'i writings. And in the another book I'm working on, on the poems of Tahirei, she dwells at great length in these poems on the essential nature of free will in the creation. So the importance of studying the life and actions of the covenant breakers is number one, so we can see, can we can spot it if we sense it happening again. Uh, there's a, a wonderful image or metaphor that Baha'u'llah uses in discussing this. He, he uses the olfactory sensibility, that there's an odor of mischief. You sense an odor of mischief. Uh, well, that doesn't mean there's necessarily covenant breaking going on, but if you sense that, then your ears should per, per, uh, prick up. The, so that's one reason. Another is to see that the covenant can be as secure uh, as, uh, as any law and so far as the written guidance, but it stands so long, only so long as the people uh, who follow it maintain it. Uh, so uh, uh, we can say, yes, the covenant is secure. Well, it's secure in writing and law and even legally, but this doesn't mean there won't be attempts to undo it. So let's look again at the life of, of Mason Remy from a different point of view, not the man who just suddenly declared himself guardian at age 87. Here he is in a picture that I've shown you a couple of classes ago as one of the early pilgrims uh, to the, the Holy Land from the West, uh, and you see here, sitting on the lap of this woman, Shoghi Effendi is about, I would say, a two or three year old. Uh, and so this would be around uh, 1898. I think Shoghi Effendi was born in 1897. Uh, very handsome man, you can see. This he is in uh, sort of the... Uh, uh, in his later years, but as a hand of the cause, doing incredible work as an architect, just amazing work. And he has letters, and, and part of his claim was based on the fact that he had these lovely statements about 
his character and his dedication from Shoghi Effendi. What were his accomplishments that we can see that we are tangible? We could list all of his teaching endeavors and so on. But the, so much of what he did still stands, and some of it is yet to be uh, um, carried out. He designed the uh, archives building, and this was completed during the life of Shoghi Effendi. He designed uh, as architect the house of worship in Uganda. He designed the house of worship in Vale and uh, across the bay there from Sydney in Australia. I've been there and that's just lovely. He designed the house of worship that will be built on Mount Carmel in, um, excuse me, the house of worship that will be built in Tehran. And the house of worship that will be built on Carmel in the future. So these two are, will be in the future, but they still, even though he became a covenant breaker, the art that he did is uh, approved by the guardian and will will go forward here he is in his later years i'm not sure exactly when this was taken but he lived to be a hundred years old so when you heard last week on that recording bora Kavalin, who was elected to the house of justice the first house of justice you heard him as chairman of the uh, the convention of the united states uh, in electing the National Spiritual Assembly in 1960, talk about Mason Remy at the age of 87, declaring that he was the uh, successor to the guardianship and given the reasons why. Or he, he gave this sort of convoluted logic that we discussed last time. So as I just got through saying, declaring one a covenant breaker is a process, not an event. It's just not something that, happened. okay, he did this, he's a covenant breaker. No. As you recall last week, we discussed and read some of the um, uh, comments by the hands of the cause and the holy man, man both to Mason Remy and to others. And there's more letters that they wrote to him as they pled with him to give up uh, this, that it was not, not uh, feasible and uh, that it didn't follow uh, the criteria, the three criteria listed in the will and testament of Abdu'l Baha, that the guardian had to be a branch, a descendant of Baha'u'llah. He had to be appointed by the guardian during the guardian's lifetime. Well, of course, Remy said, well, look, I have these things where he appointed me uh, to the uh, be president of the International Baha'i Council, which was a forerunner of the House of Justice. But it wasn't the House of Justice and it wasn't elected. <clears throat> Excuse me. So much counseling and consultation precedes such a designation. Opportunities are given to recant or, or claim, uh, recant the claim or opposition to the faith. Effectively, one removes himself or herself from the cause. A painful final decision to be made by the custodians, and they had a great deal of trouble because he had been among them his whole life as a hand of the cause. He was a hand of a cause uh, appointed, uh, I believe, in the uh, before the first contingent was one of the individual. Uh, I'm not positive on that. I'll have to check. So ultimately, uh, as they discussed this, one of the hands of the cause said, we must follow the guidance of Abdu'l Baha and the will and testament. And what was he referring to or she referring to? My object is to show that hands of the cause must be ever watchful. Now, this is describing their function as protectors of the faith. And so soon as they find anyone beginning to oppose or protest against the guardian of the cause, cast him out from the congregation of the people of Baha. 
and in no wise accept any excuse from him. How often hath grievous error been disguised in the garb of truth, that it might sow seeds of doubt in the hearts of men. So there was their answer. They had no choice. He persisted in doing this very thing. They tried to uh, bring him back to his senses, but he would not. So, as I said, it is a sort of self-banishment, a self-inflicted banishment. And remember, you had the example in uh, the Baha'i history uh, a number of classes ago of Badi Ullah, the youngest son of Baha'u'llah, who uh, joined Mirza Muhammad Ali against Abdul Baha, then recanted that and rejoined Abdul Baha and wrote that confession, uh, indicting Mirza Muhammad Ali and listing all the things he had done. And then he went back. And why? Why did this, why does this happen? Well, we can't know, you know, the heart and mind and soul of such individuals. But Paul, St. Paul, of course, said the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, sometimes this is shortened to say money is the root of all evil. No, it, it's not the ac actual money. And it's not even the love of money. It's the love of what money provides, which is power. It's really the love of power and prestige that is the root of evil. In most cases, not in every case, there can, of course, be other kinds of, of evil and iniquity. But this is the principal one when we're talking about the quest for position or power. It is as addictive as any hideous drug we can name. We see that happening in our pol politics today, how it is utterly ruining the uh, um, governments of the world. How is he doing now? And that may sound silly, but I don't mean it as such. The fact is there are very explicit passages in the uh, Some Answered Questions by Abdul Baha, where he says, even those who have died in sin and unbelief may become the object of pardon. And he goes on to explain how that can happen. And he says, after they have passed on, uh, that if they recognize their the iniquity of what they've done and plead for forgiveness and are sincere uh, that they can be forgiven and that they can change so change is not determined by this life this life after all as we've said as one of the foundational principles of the baha'i teachings is preparation for the continuation of our life in the real world the world of the spirit the learning and teaching the cause, the learned and teaching the cause. Now, this is the beginning of what we're going to discuss at more uh, length next time. But the hands of the cause are to diffuse the divine fragrances, which is just a, a lovely way of talking about promoting the teaching and learning. To improve the character of all men and to be at all times and under all conditions, sanctified and detached from earthly things. They must manifest the fear of God by their conduct, their manners, their deeds, and their words. Now, imagine, if you will, that what it must be like to be appointed a counselor, because the counselors, while not having the status of the hands of the cause uh, in, in one sense, uh, they aren't appointed by the guardian. They are appointed by the House of Justice. And as such, they are the successors to the position and functions of the hands of the cause. So if you read this and you become, you become selected as a counselor, imagine how careful you must be in everything you do and what a burden or weight that is, a divine one to be sure. Teaching is central to our spiritual development. Now, there I'm talking about us individually. So this is still preparation for what we're going to discuss next week. 
And this is a very familiar quote from Baha'u'llah, teach ye the cause, O people of Baha. For God hath prescribed unto everyone the duty of proclaiming his message and regarded it as the most meritorious, meritorious of all deeds. So the most meritorious, uh, that's uh, uh, very clear, isn't it? It is not ambiguous at all. So this is the, you know, what can we do in this time? We asked earlier in the class tonight. Well, that's the most meritorious thing we can do. Now, how we do it and what methodologies we use is to a certain extent largely personal. And yet <clears throat> the guidance we receive from the institution of the learned in conjunction with the Universal House of Justice in devising the plans, the teaching plans, are very clear about specific courses of action we can take. Excuse me, let me have some tea. <clears throat> and of course, one of them, speaking of courses of action, is the course themselves, the institution, the institute courses. And I strongly recommend chapter, I mean, uh, book eight of that, if you want to take a deep dive into the value of knowing about the covenant. So the institution of the counselors, as we said last time, was established in 1968 to replace the fact, uh, to replace the hands of the cause, who at that time had diminished down to a handful of individuals. Uh, and then the counselors now uh, uh, meet in the... Um, teaching center, the World Teaching Center. So this is the uh, far-flung ark that the Guardian himself designed. And this was the first building, the archives. Uh, this is the repository of the holy texts. Uh, this is the House of Justice. And this is the World Teaching Center. And then there will be one more building in the future, which will be a library that will be constructed. Here's what it looks like up close. If you've ever been in it, you know what a beautiful building it is. It doesn't look all that large uh, until you realize that a great deal of it is underground. It's a huge building. In 2001, then, we created, uh, or we didn't create the House of Justice in uh, consultation with the hands, uh, not, excuse me, with the counselors created. And this is their message to the counselors, the Conference of Counselors, on January 9th, 2001, the concept of the cluster. And we're still utilizing this concept. Now, it's not an institution. Uh, and even though it has agencies, uh, it does not have, uh, it's not elected, uh, and it is a geographical area designed with some flexibility uh, by the uh, counselors in consultation. So as the letter uh, instigating or in, uh, initiating the nine-year plan and say one of the things that will occur and that sh should occur is that uh, the clusters should evaluate whether there needs to be some change in their boundaries uh, uh, and so forth. So let's read this uh, uh, from the House of Justice. And this is, notice, it seems so short a time ago to me when the cluster was first instituted. Uh, because I'd been a Baha'i for 40 years at that time. And yet it's 21 years ago. There are many countries where increased institutional activity capacity, particularly at the level of the region, now makes it possible to focus attention on smaller geographic areas. Most of these will consist of a cluster of villages and towns, but sometimes a large city and its suburbs may constitute an area of this kind. Among the factors that determine the boundaries of a cluster are culture, language, patterns of transport, infrastructure, and the social and economic life of the inhabitants. The areas into which a region divides will fall into various categories of development. 
So uh, one of, as I said, one of the things we uh, do up front as we begin to carry out the uh, guidance of the nine-year plan is to say, okay, can we, uh, can our cluster be uh, um, designed in a more efficacious way to carry out the teaching and creation of community life? which after all is the central function and focus of the plans from the last four or five year plans and into the nine year plan is the creation of community life, not just in the Baha'i community, but in the larger community as well. In 1996, LSAs were designated as the electors of regional councils. Now, here's another institution that was created. Now, this is not part of the administrative order per se. Per se. They are elected, but they have no executive function. Their job is to oversee the teaching in their uh, area. Uh, and these are called regional councils, and the LSAs elect them, but they aren't responsible to the LSAs nor do the LSAs have anything to uh, to say about their function. LSAs were designated as the electors of regional councils, though these councils have no authority over the LSAs, rather their function is to oversee the functioning of the regional institutes and facilitate creating, implementing, and providing continually, in, it should be continual, guidance for the agencies in each cluster. The clusters were guided by the core group. I say were because <clears throat> there's flexibility there too. Some are still, still formally put together this way, but originally were designed, they were consisted of the auxiliary board member for that area, the institute coordinator, the junior youth coordinator, the children's classes coordinator, and the area teaching committee. And so we ended up uh, with this same familiar chart I've showed you several times. So you have the, uh, uh, the cluster down here, which consists of individual Baha'is, registered groups, local assemblies, non-Baha'is, and the core group, which guides the cluster, is the uh, auxiliary board member, the uh, CIC, the CCC, Children's Class Coordinator, Institute Coordinator, a Junior Youth Guidance uh, uh, Program Group Coordinator, and the Area Teaching Committee, and the assistance to the Auxiliary Board. And so the local assemblies elect the regional council here, which is under the guidance or the authority of the NSA, but their authority doesn't go down to the assemblies. It goes like this. So the authority of the NSA oversees the regional council and the LSAs. The regional council oversees the uh, uh, regional training institute board and its functioning, the regional training institute. So some of these lines, the, the dark ones are designating authority. The dotted lines are communication. And ultimately, you end up with sort of a web, uh, a beautiful uh, web of where information is going up here and it, decisions are made here and the decisions come down here. So it kind of goes like this, though it can also go up through the LSAs to the NSAs to here. So an LSA may ask the National Assembly, we've got a problem, what do we do? And the National Assembly will give authority or ask the House of Justice, and the House of Justice will give information. But always the auxiliary board um, is in tune with the local assemblies via their assistance and their own uh, physical presence giving information to the continental counselors for that continent, continent, and then the continental counselors are giving information to the International Teaching Center 
which is an appointed nine-membered body consisting of nine counselors appointed by the House of Justice, and they give information to the House of Justice, and the House of Justice, of course, gives authority to them. So you, I didn't draw enough lines because then you'd be nothing but lines, but you, you get the idea. And this is something we'll <clears throat> look at um, more next week as we look at the plans, the teaching plans, because it's very interesting uh, to see where we are in the unfoldment of the Baha'i faith and the Baha'i uh, teaching plans. This is where we are now in the third epoch of the Tablets of the Divine Plan, the Tablet of the Divine Plan. We're in the sixth epoch of uh, the formative age. Uh, so you have these terms, a cycle. What is a, a cycle? A cycle is, uh, we know of two <laughs> so far uh, that we have any knowledge of. We have the Adamic cycle, also called the prophetic cycle, uh, which ends with, which begins with Adam, uh, and ends with uh, Muhammad, who is the, and that's another sense in which Muhammad is the uh, the um, seal of the prophets. He's the seal of the prophets in the prophi prophetic cycle that prophesy the beginning of this cycle, the day of days. The Baha'i cycle, which begins in 1844 and will endure at least 500,000 years. Then you have the Baha'i era or dispensation. This is the faith of Baha'u'llah. Though all the future faiths in this cycle will, le uh, will exist under the shadow of the influence of what Baha'u'llah will have established, namely a global order. And so the Baha'i religion will last at least a thousand years. And if you think about it, it's kind of scary in a way that we've got uh, 179 years have passed since the beginning of the faith. That means that approximately 18% of this has already passed. Now, it may last more than 1,000 years, but at least 1,000 years. So what are the ages? So you have cycles, eras or dispensations, and ages. Well, you have ages within the Baha'i faith, a heroic age, begins with the Bab and ends with the passing of Abdu'l Baha. The formative age, which begins with the guardianship in 1921. We don't know when it will last, but we do know that, but we'll talk about that more over the coming three classes. And then uh, uh, we'll, it will end with the advent of the Golden Age, uh, which we don't know when it began, but we know it could end as soon as uh, 3044. That would be a thousand years from its beginning. I think I did that right. Maybe I'm wrong. It's possible. Which means, as I say, 18% of it could be transpired. Epochs are within the ages. So you've got the epochs of Baha'i history and you've got the epochs of the divine plan. So we're in the sixth epoch of Baha'i history. We're in the third epoch of the divine teaching plans. So what will bring about the lesser peace? Uh, it will still be part of the formative age specific events that we know about will transpire in the meantime. Specific requirements from the Baha'is are already in motion, according to the guidance of Shoghi Effendi. The structure of governance as the lesser peace evolves is described, and we'll discuss that at length, uh, the class after next. The structure of the Baha'i administrative order as the lesser piece evolves will be discussed class after next. And uh, we will then see the change that will occur from the lesser piece, and that will be our last class, from the lesser piece to the golden age of Baha'u'llah. 
All right. Well, uh, I, this was uh, uh, class lacked a little focus, but the, the primary thing is about the history of the faith in relation to the protection of the faith in particular and the teaching plans uh, as uh, not just uh, incidental to or additional to the protection of the cause, but really part of it. And so if you have, for example, someone saying, well, uh, I, I love the Baha'i faith and I, uh, I love the House of Justice, uh, but I think that the teaching plans don't make any sense to me and I, I just don't want to participate in them. You really are in dangerous uh, territory if you, uh, if you act according to that, even if you think that, you, but to, you need to examine your thoughts and think, wait a minute, this derives from an infallible body. Uh, the house of justice, this guidance. Uh, it's not something I can just say, well, uh, they may think it's okay, but it's uh, when I observe it at work uh, in, in my community, it just doesn't seem to be happening. I'd like to go back to 50 years ago when we just used to meet at somebody's house, say some prayers, have some cookies and cake and uh, go home. Uh, and, uh, and say my obligatory prayer. The, the, the Baha'i faith was a parlor religion, uh, effectively, for almost 100 years. And what we're going to discuss next time is how that changed and how the Universal House of Justice saw what needed to happen to make that change. And I think you'll find it interesting. I hope you will. It's interesting to me. All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Well, let me get to the closing slide.